All right, welcome back. And today we're going to do something people have asked me a long time ago to do. We're going to go over everything there is to know about doing Hell Raid. Now, as always, I break my guide video down into digestible parts for your convenience. So today the sections will be number one, why you need to do Hell Raid. Number two, Hell Raid basics. And then number three, we go into boss breakdowns for every single boss. Now, for each of those bosses, it'll have three sections as well. Number one, we'll go over the boss's skills and unique abilities. Number two, the ideal hero makeup to tackle these bosses. And number three, the overall strategy and a showcase of me defeating each of these bosses. Now, when I go over the heroes, if you don't have the specific heroes I'm using, it doesn't matter. I'm going to discuss heroes in terms of generalities like class and the abilities that they need. Not specific heroes, because not everyone has Tamarin or Ken or whatever hero I might be using. So with that out of the way, let's get started. So topic number one is why do you need to do Hell Raid? Well, the main reason, to be honest, are these two pieces of gear right here. The Hell Raid Sword and the Hell Raid Immunity Armor are considered best in slot. I mean, we're reforging out now, you could probably get better than these, but for a long time, these were considered the gold standard for the best gear. And you want multiples of these because you always pray that it rolls really well. A lot of people rocking 20 plus speed weapons are rocking this sword and they just got lucky and everything rolled into speed. But you can get one of these a month if you clear all five bosses. And really that's the main reason to do Hell Raid. Now, outside of that, the first time you clear the bosses, they actually drop some pretty sick gear. So I can't get them anymore. But the very first time you beat the boss, you will get one piece of sick gear. And also, every time you kill them, they can drop a random piece of gear. And some of them are pretty good, like this counter chest. Some of these counter chests are my best gear in the game. Um, the sets are hard-coded, though, so sometimes it's not the set you want. But in general, these drops are <coughs> excellent and pretty on par with reforged gear. Now, the final thing that a lot of people run in for is 88 defense set rings. Back then, these were considered best in slot because they were the only 88 rings you could get. Nowadays, with reforging, it's probably not as critical because a lot of people don't use defense sets. But, you know, they don't, they can have different main stats. So, if you're not trying to finish the last two sets, then it doesn't matter. It's still pretty solid gear. So those are the main reasons why you want to do Hell Raid. It's mainly access to all of this really powerful 88 gear. And on top of that, you could still get galaxy bookmarks, etc, etc. But mainly it's for 88 gear and speeding up your gear progression. So let's move on to topic number two. All right, so topic number two is the basics of Hell Raid. Let's cover four mini topics real quick. Number one, how often can you do Hell Raid? How do you get Hell Raid entry tokens, morale? and bosses so first of all how often can you do hell raid it just reset today and you'll notice it's available for 29 days basically you can do hell raid once a month and then the bosses won't respawn once you kill them until the 30 days has passed to get hell raid tokens you the best ways to do normal difficulty raid and kill the queen and the queen will always drop one of these malicious bug charms if you don't want to do that once a week in the regular shop, you can buy um, one malicious bug charm for three labyrinth compasses, or you can buy it for ancient coins. So those are your other options, but really you can do regular raid four times and maybe just buy one of those charms from the other thing. In general, you don't want to waste those resources just on malicious bug charms. So that's how you get hell raid tokens. Now, topic number three, or mini topic number three, is morale. My advice is morale actually doesn't matter as much as it used to because um, you can skip a lot of the content now. But if you're trying to beat as many 88 mini bosses as possible, then what you want to do is find a labyrinth morale calculator online, plug in your heroes, and figure out what has the most morale. And remember, just like regular raid, you can camp and you need to pick the right conversation choices. It's very variable to get the most morale boost out of it. Uh, the morale is kind of similar to regular raid. You know, if you have high morale, you have a health bonus. If it's low enough, you basically can't kill anything. Now, the final thing I wanted to cover real quick before we get started with the bosses is teleportation. You'll notice there's this icon here. You won't see it 
if you haven't beaten the bosses yet. But once you beat each of these bosses, if you find Hell Raid really boring like I do, and you just want to kill the bosses and get the hell out of there, you can basically click this. You'll teleport teleport right before the boss. You could fight the boss right away, and once you kill it, you just teleport right back to the middle, click the clear portal, and then you'll be done with Hell Raid. So those are the real quick basics that I wanted to cover. Now let's go into the interesting part, the boss breakdowns. Alright, so let's start off with the first Hell Raid boss, one of the first two released and by far the easiest one, Devourer Arahakon. Let's go over skills real quick. Number one, Crisis Response. If he goes below 50% health, he gets an extra turn and resets his skill cooldowns. Incubate Venom. It's basically just a rage mechanic. If you take too long to kill him, he gets stronger and stronger. This is his most important move. When Corrupted Web can be used, grants immunity that cannot be dispelled and dramatically decreases damage suffered. You'll notice that he has a thick looking immunity and defense buff. Basically he's invincible in this phase. Like, he's not theoretically invincible, but you do so little damage that in practice he is. When Corrupted Web cannot be used, so basically if it's on cooldown, your entire team gets unable to be debuffed or unable to be buffed that cannot be dispelled and ignores immunity. So the key here is you need to put all your buffs up before he uses this move or you're going to have a permanent unbuffable on yourself. And you'll see that more in the strategy phase. Dash, he has a chance to stun you and Corrupted Web, he'll put decreased speed on you, decrease your combat readiness enormously and then summon two Azamanis Scouts. Now, recommended heroes for this is I'm using Tamarin, Amomo, Seedom, and Ken. You can really use anything for this boss as long as you follow the proper strategy. It's not like some bosses where you have to make sure you bring very specific heroes. Here, I recommend either two healers or one healer and a knight and two DPS, one of which has a defense break to speed things up. Other than that, you have a wide variety of heroes you can use because this boss doesn't really punish any specific mechanics very much. So just bring two healers or one healer and a knight and two of your best geared DPSs. Let's go into the strategy. So the basic strategy here is to just keep killing these little baby spiders until Arahakon uses his S3, I guess and you can then do big damage to him. But the important part is to make sure that you have all your buffs up before he uses this S3, because there's a undispellable, unable to be buffed debuff that he puts on you. So if you don't buff up before, you're not going to be able to buff up at all. Now let's fast forward this a bit. Alright, so now that I know that I can kill this spider on this turn and the boss will use his S3, this is where you kill the spider and put up as many buffs as possible before the boss goes into his like uh, crazy unbuffable mode. So I'm going to use my Tamarin's S2 here, I'm going to put up Ken's Vigor, and then the boss is going to spit a stupid spider web on me and uh, you'll notice that right away I get unbuffable. So let's just let this spider get his turn now. Whap, whap, and now he's gonna spit a big loogie at me. Now, if you looked at the top left, you'll notice that he lost that immunity and the defense buff. So now you can actually hit the spider and do big damage to him. The one thing that's not on the skill icons though is these white spiders, when they attack, they will heal whoever has the lowest health. So if Arahakon has the lowest health, these spiders will just heal him back to full. So it's also in your best interest to get at least a little bit of damage on the spider like there. Now that the spider is low, I can just leave him like that. And now I go back to Arahakon and watch the white spider's life when the other white spiders attack. It should heal him up a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and push again. You'll notice that I can't buff or do anything, but it didn't matter there. And look at that little white spider's light. You notice how it got healed? That's why I hit that spider in the beginning. And you have a few turns to do this. This Devour Our Hackon's gonna have his buffs up again in this next turn. And then you just have to rinse and repeat. But hopefully 
I can uh, get lucky with my C-Dom and get him into the 50% phase right now. And then you're going to notice that he immediately becomes invulnerable again because of this move. Oh, no, he resisted it. So now I have to deal with going through one more phase of this. All right, let's go ahead and get him below 50% right now just so I could show you. We're going to burn it here. And now you're going to notice he uses his S3 right away because of his first move. But other than that, this is exactly the same. There's no change to the mechanic. Now I just kill these white spiders again and rinse and repeat. So as you can see, the strategy for this fight is pretty straightforward. You just keep attacking the spiders anytime they're up. And as soon as they're down, you hit one of the spiders to make sure it's lower than Devour Arahakon so it doesn't heal him. And then you just keep attacking Devour Arahakon Rinse and repeat until he's dead. Like here you'll notice, again, that this spider is getting healed and not the boss. If you don't hit the spiders at all, Devour Air Hack is going to get huge health spikes and make it really hard for you. But other than that, this is all you do. Just keep killing the white spiders, attack the boss, and then rinse and repeat. So let's fast forward to the end. Alright, now we're all set up for our win, so let's finish this boss off. So like I said, none of the strategy changed since what I said. Basically, you just rinse repeat killing the white spiders, and once you think you got him low enough to one-shot him, that's what you do. So my C-Dom's coming up next, and we can't buff, so we'll just attack. Whap, and with the soul burn, he is definitely dead. So again, basics are just keep alternating between the white spider and the boss, and it should be an easy win for you. Let's move on to the next boss. All right, boss number two, Executioner Carcanus. A lot of people used to struggle with him. He actually hits really hard, but let's go over his moves real quick. Dev Sentence. Basically, when he gets below 40% health, he starts attacking twice in a row. If this is off cooldown, he'll hit you with this and then trigger this. And if he deep breaks you with the first one, it's basically an automatic kill. Shadow, when he goes below 70% health, he goes into stealth. And you have to knock him out of stealth with AoE moves. Otherwise, he starts healing himself and getting even more attack and speed buffs. Inner Peace, basically anytime he attacks, he gets increased attack and speed. Also, if you have a debuff, you can't attack Harkanis because he has a really high chance to dodge. And then he'll counterattack you. And if it's a squishy DPS, basically one-shot you. So do not attack Carcanus while you're debuffed. And these two moves are pretty self-explanatory. Um, Wild Slash will attack your entire team and stun one of your team members. If um, the target's health is less than 50% at the time of the attack, remaining health after attack will be decreased by 99%. So basically it's like a one-shot move. These two creeps... You, they, you can see their skill indicators under their thing too. Um, they'll attack, every time they attack, they de-spell one of your buffs. And when they max out their S3, basically they have an AoE move that puts a whole crap ton of debuffs on you. But immunity does work against that. So basically you want to keep up immunity right before they use that move or have a lot of cleanse. Talking about heroes... Um, you'll notice I brought two Soul Weavers and two DPS. If you want to play it safe, you can do two Soul Weavers, one Knight, one DPS. Or you can do one Soul Weaver, one Knight, and two DPS. The key things that you have to bring here are at minimum one Cleanser, ideally two. You'll notice I have Tamarin and a Momo. Or you could do something like a Momo and Lilius. The point is you need to have at least two people cleansing because they have a lot of debuffs. And remember, if your DPS is debuffed, they cannot attack Carcanus without getting countered. Other than that, make sure you bring at least one character that has an AoE move to knock him out of stealth when he gets to 70%. That should cover skills and heroes. Let's go into the showcase. All right, guys. So the first phase of the fight when the match starts is pretty brainless. You don't really have to do anything, you just keep attacking Carcanus and healing your team over and over. There's no special mechanic or anything you have to be worried about other than do not attack Carcanus with debuffed units. Now I want you to look at these little bug guys. Now that their move is off cooldown, they're gonna like do the song singing thing. So I'm gonna put immunity on my Spectre Tenebria. If you have immunity on your team, Put it up right before they use that final move, this one. 
because otherwise your whole team is going to get debuffs. Notice how everyone except Spectre Tenebria is gathering debuffs right now. Other than that, there's really nothing to this phase, like I said. Just keep attacking and healing, attacking and healing, and do not attack Carcanus if you have a debuff on. All right, so this is phase two of the fight. I just hit him and got him below 70% health, so notice that he is now stealthed. I can't hit him with single target attacks, and if I don't get him out of stealth, he'll start healing himself. So what you gotta do is literally just use any AoE move, and it will instantly knock him out of stealth, and then basically the fight is back to normal. Now you just keep attacking him and get him to below 40% health and that will trigger the next phase of the fight. So let's go ahead and do that now because probably going to get pretty close to 40% pretty soon right here. So we'll just heal up here. Spectre Tenebria will dump the S3 into Carcanus, and this should bring him down below 40%. And when he enters his phase, he resets his cooldowns and attacks you twice. So this is what happens every two turns in his final phase. He'll stun someone and do big damage. I resisted it, fortunately. But this is the phase that gets scary. It's a gear check. If you don't have good gear, you might not be able to kill him in time before the damage starts getting out of control. But for me, should not be a big deal. He'll probably die right here. So I'm going to immunity my Spectre to Nebria. The bugs are going to do their little singing song thing, but my Spectre Tenebri has immunity, so it's no problem. And now we'll just finish off Harkanus. One. Two. And it'll be close. Oh, there we go. And now Carcanus is dead. So that's pretty much all you have to do to kill Carcanus as long as you don't attack him when you're debuffed and you have an AoE move to get him out of stealth. Other than that, it's just a gear check. Let's move on to the next boss. All right, now let's talk about Julie Council. For those of you who are new to Hell Raid, um, a long time ago, there were only two Hell Raid bosses, the first two that we discussed. And then he dropped Julie and the other two, uh, Queen. And so basically, the final three bosses are way harder than the first two. Let's go over Julie's abilities first as usual. Black Death. So same as regular Labyrinth 1, when it gets below 70 and 40%, she splits into three swarms. You have to find out which one it is, and every turn all your buffs are being dispelled and you're taking pretty big damage. So it's not that difficult as long as you have healing, you just keep spamming heals and finding the right one. Inflict Curse, this is kind of the core part of her kit. If you debuff her, she gets a random buff for two turns before dispelling all the debuffs. So basically the name of the game is do not ever debuff her or you're completely screwed. Heroes like Commander Lorena, Challenger Dominil, or Luna are ideal for this. Plague. Poisoned enemies will poison themselves and an ally at the beginning of the turn. So you'll notice that she poisoned two people and I already have four poisons on me. These poisons blow up so you really want a lot of cleanses. Spread disease. Attacks and random any dispels one buff before poisoning for a turn and giving her stacked attack. And her poisons ignore effect resistance, so even a Momo will get poisoned. Um, if the caster is buffed, she'll attack three times in a row. And group ambush is she just it's just an AoE attack. It dispels all your buffs and extends your poison durations by two turns. Um, if she's buffed, it ignores effect resistance. That's basically her moves. Let's talk about heroes. Basically, a Momo is mandatory. You really need a lot of cleansing. If you have a Momo and Tamarin, it's good enough. I brought Lilius too. If you don't have Tamarin, do a Momo and Lilius. But because there's so many poisons on this stupid level, you really want to have a lot of cleansing available. Obviously, for your damage dealer, you need someone that doesn't have debuffs under attack. Do not bring any debuffs or basically this fight becomes 100 times harder, maybe even impossible. Make sure your primary DPSer does not debuff on their S1. Um, other than that, there's really no strategy to this fight. It's really straightforward. Um, you basically just keep attacking, never debuff the boss, and uh, let's go ahead and do this until we get to the next phase. All right, so I've just been DPSing Julie. She should split pretty soon here, and then we get to see the next phase of this fight. There we go, she teleports to the front. 
Now she splits into three bug swarms, and you'll notice I took damage there. You take damage every single turn, and all your buffs are dispelled. So there's like, watch, I'm gonna buff attack here, and next turn, it's just gonna fall off everyone. Notice that? So buffs are completely useless in this phase, and it's literally just a DPS race. You have to find the correct insect swarm. As far as I know, it's completely random. If someone knows exactly which one it is every time, feel free to leave it in the comments. But I basically just go through them one by one, and when you finally bring the correct one down to zero HP, you'll enter the next phase of the fight. All right, so this is the last one. So I got unlucky and it was the very last one I attacked, but that's fine. Now we enter the next phase. And honestly, all the phases are pretty much the same, except um, at the end, Julie Council will start buffing herself with a random buff when she's 40% or less. But this second phase is essentially the exact same as the first phase. You just keep cleansing, keep attacking her, making sure not to put debuffs on her. Honestly, this fight is pretty brainless, so I'm going to fast forward to the next split phase again. Alright, so we should enter the final split phase soon here, and then we'll have to go and butcher all those bug swarms again. But again, that next phase is exactly like the first split phase, so this fight if it's hard for you, it's entirely a gear and sustainability problem because you take damage every turn. Like you could see I'm taking damage every turn, but my A Momo and Tamarin can essentially indefinitely heal it. If your gear is not up to par, you're gonna struggle because this little tick every turn will eventually kill you because you're not healing enough. But as long as you have enough damage output and healing output, there's really no strategy here, like there's nothing in this phase that, you know, if you do, you die or anything like that. It's literally just a tank and spank. So let's go to the final phase now. All right, so now we enter the final phase after beating on those bugs. Notice I'm pretty high health because I had to sustain. And now this is literally the same as the other times she was out here. The only difference is, um, what's that move? Here we go. When the caster's health is 40% or less, grants the caster a random buff for two turns at the end of the turn. So, ideally, you will dispel that extra buff, but honestly, it doesn't really matter that much. Like, if you don't dispel it, she'll attack three times instead of two times, so she will have more damage output. But I have found that even when I bring teams without a dispeller, it's really no big deal. Again, this is just another basic tank and spank. As long as you can out heal her damage, there's really nothing that happens here. So let's um, go ahead and wrap this fight up. All right, so we're at the tail end of the fight here. I'm pretty sure this Arky will just kill Julie. But again, um, that's the basic premise of this fight. As long as you bring a DPS that doesn't have debuffs, the fight should be fairly trivial. If you're struggling on Julie, it's probably a matter of gear because you need to be able to outheal the damage that she does in that split phase. So that's pretty much it. Let's move on to the next boss. All right, now let's talk about Secretary Vera. This one's kind of a tough one. Let's go over her abilities. So Protective Instinct. It dispels a debuff from the caster and gives her stacking, attack, and defense at the start of the turn. If there are any remaining allies, damage suffered from attacks that target all enemies decreased by 70%, and suffering single attacks will trigger an additional attack on all enemies with a 75% chance to stun. So the most important part about this is anytime you have enemies up, you do not want to attack Secretary Barrow with a single target attack, or she will counter and stun your whole team. Prepare evolution. If the health is 50% or less, attacks all enemies. We'll discuss that more in the phases. Mystery of life. Anytime an Azamanis hatcher, which are the eggs, hatches, she gets increased attack and speed. And um, anytime you attack them, she gets extra CR. If there's no remaining allies, she gets an extra turn every four times she's attacked. Skew Rocks is a basic move. She attacks and stuns two random people at a 50% chance and incubate egg 
she'll every three turns summon up to four Azimanus Watchers. The kicker here is if you didn't kill all the eggs, then they reduce all their skill cooldowns and they get an extra turn so they hatch immediately. So basically the goal is to kill all the eggs with AoEs before attacking her. Now let's talk about heroes. Basically you want two healers, two DPS, or one healer, one knight, two DPS. You know, a lot of these raid bosses have the same format. But the key here is that you need a lot of AoE damage. So I normally wouldn't use Kron, but things like Kron, SSB, um, regular Vildred, maybe even Arbiter Vildred, you need someone with a lot of AoE damage to try and clear out these eggs ASAP before they spawn. Single target damage just won't kill them fast enough and you can't attack him with single targets until all the adds are dead. So now let's go over strategy. All right, so the strategy in the beginning is basically to try and AOE all of these stupid egg things down. If you don't do it, then you're gonna get trucked. Now what you don't want to do is attack Secretary Vera with any single target attack, because if you do, she's basically gonna stun up your entire team. So just nuke out with as many AoE attacks as possible and try to clear out these eggs ASAP. Now the problem is when you attack these eggs, um, Secretary Vera gets more and more CR, but that's fine. And this fight can get tough because Secretary Vera gets a lot of turns and keeps bringing these stupid eggs back. But it is what it is, you just have to keep doing it rinsing and repeating until the next phase. So there we go, we'll finish off this egg. Now she spits rocks at us, and now we can attack Secretary Vera without being afraid of being counterattacked. I mean, that was an AoE attack anyway, but an attack like this would have immediately triggered a counterattack. And you see that mystery of life thing popping up? Every four times you attack her, she gets an extra turn. So now she's gonna get an extra turn and immediately bring all of her egg things back. But basically that's all there is to this phase. Just don't attack Secretary Vera. You can use AoE attacks, like I'll do this here. No problem. All the eggs are pretty much cleared here. And uh, now after I kill this one, we can move on to attacking Secretary Vera. So just rinse and repeat until 50%. All right, so we're about to enter phase two here. Now, phase two is actually simpler than phase one, because in phase two, Secretary Vera turns into an egg and basically summons a few adds. The adds are annoying because they can dispel, decrease CR by 100%, and provoke. But the easy thing about this fight is you don't really kill them. Um, basically, you ignore the adds completely and you just try and take down this egg as fast as possible. I found that that is the most effective strategy because the adds have a lot of life. I never even attempted to kill them. The egg itself is not that tanky, so just burst it down as quickly as you can. And that's pretty much all there is to this phase. All right, now the egg's down, so now let's move on to phase three. Now in phase three, um, her attacks can stun and her S2 has AoE reduced attack, but again, in this phase you basically just ignore the adds again. Like, look how tanky these adds are, there's really no reason going on them. You ignore the adds and just DPS Secretary Vera. She doesn't do a whole lot of damage, the stuns are annoying, but basically it's just another tank and spank, and she's actually, in my opinion, squishier than the first phase. So you just keep attacking her, cleansing whenever necessary, and eventually you'll kill her. So we'll fast forward when she's lower life. All right, so we're nearing the end here. One thing I failed to note is that in the last phase, she also summons eggs, but they're so squishy that with any reasonable AoE damage, you'll be destroying them like almost immediately. So I like barely notice them because watch, I'll just do this and that egg's gonna die immediately. And now from this point, this fight is pretty much a wrap. Um, not that much to do here. So really this uh, fight isn't too bad as long as you bring the right team. Make sure you have a lot of AoE DPS because it really comes down to cleaning out those eggs quickly. Vera herself doesn't do a whole lot of damage. So as long as you can just tank and AoE those adds down, 
you should really have no problem beating her. And there she goes. Secretary Vera goes down. Now let's move on to the big bad queen. All right, time for the big kahuna, Queen Azumashik. Let's go over her ability. She's the toughest one by far. Queen Servant, she's a lot like the regular raid one. Um, when she gets to 50% health, she gets an extra turn and summons her bees. Uh, she absorbs some of the damage taken from her devourer Arahakons. And um, eggs are invincible immune, pretty much same as regular raid. Queen's Authority at the end of the turn. This is the most important part about her. She gets increased attack and defense buffs before also getting stackable increased attack and speed that you can't dispel. Now, if she has increased attack at the end of the turn, then she gives herself increased attack greater and increased defense greater. If she already has those buffs, then she gives all those buffs to her allies. So as you can see, it goes from no buffs to attack to greater attack to greater attack for her entire team. When it's granted to an ally, those buffs can't be dispelled. So basically, you the key part to this fight is making sure that you're constantly dispelling the queen. Otherwise, everyone's going to get these greater buffs and make it really hard for you to win. Queen's Terror decreases target's attack, effect resist, and speed as your health goes down, so you really want to keep yourself topped off. At the start of turn, if you have less than 30% health, then you're going to get stunned. When the caster's health is 50% or more, it's harder to decrease combat readiness her, and when it's less than 50%, then she's immune to it. Hellish Cut just a basic attack move. Increases skill cooldowns by one turn. Um, the main thing is if she has a greater attack buff or better, then she gets an additional AoE attack that dispels one buff. So even more incentive to keep her debuff, otherwise she's going to do huge damage. And Death Trap, same as a regular raid, attack all enemies, dispels all buffs before inflicting the enemies with stackable decreased defense and recovery rate. Now for heroes, You'll notice I brought a weird squad here. You obviously need at least one Soul Weaver. Sometimes you can go with two. I'd say like Amomo and Tamarin or whatever you have. Or you can replace one of the Soul Weavers with a Knight like Lilius. Adventurer Roz is also very good here because he does have a Dispel on his S1 even though it's only one buff. And then you want two DPSs. So basically Soul Weaver, Knight, two DPSs. Or two Soul Weavers, two DPSs. Same as the others. The main key here though is... You need at least one, if not two, Dispellers. My team technically has two. Alencia has a Dispel, and Tamarin has a Dispel. So let's start this fight off, and I want you to show a small mechanic, and then I'll fast forward. But here you're going to notice she takes a turn, and bam, she has increased attack and increased defense already. So if I don't dispel this, the turn after this, it's gonna turn into increased attack greater and increased defense greater. If I still don't dispel it, then that buff gets applied to her entire team and it gets really hard. So other than that, it's the same as the regular raid queen. Now I dispelled all those buffs. Other than that, it's the same. And all you have to do is attack the devourer Arahakons and that damage will get transferred to the queen just like in regular raid. So basically, it's the exact same as regular raid as long as you continually dispel Queen Azumashik before she transfers that greater attack to her entire team. So rinse and repeat and let's move on to the next phase. Alright, so now let's move on to phase 2. Um, same as normal raid, she'll summon these bees, and uh, they can do a lot of damage, so I would highly recommend you kill them first. And there's some RNG here, depending on what debuffs you get in the beginning. Um, if you get silence on your Soul Weaver or something, it'll get pretty rough. So try and normalize or fix up your characters immediately after you get to this phase. So hopefully Lilius has her S3 up and I can cleanse all this nonsense. There we go. And now we move on to trying and kill these bees. One thing I forgot to note before is do not put more than three debuffs on Queen. I mean, my team does not have a problem with that. But if you put too many debuffs on Queen, um, she actually has this move where if you have three debuffs on her, she'll be granted an extra turn and all debuffs are dispelled. 
Another thing I forgot to mention is Daydream Joker does not work on Queen, so do not bother trying to DDJ Queen Azumashik. It will not do anything. So at this point, um, basically, tank and spank time. And it just comes down to do you have enough damage to survive and enough healing to survive? 1B is already down. Let's continue working on him. All right, so this is the end of the road here. Queen Azumashik is going to die. The quick summary is she's exactly the same as the normal raid version with the exception of the stacking buffs. You need to be constantly removing that increased attack and increased de defense buff or she's going to start getting extra attacks and she's going to start spreading that attack buff to her teammates and the fight's going to get really hard for you. So make sure you have a bare minimum of one, if not two, uh, Dispellers, Falconer, Clurry, um, Isaria, those are all really good options. I just use this uh, Alencia here because I had her built. And don't worry too much about effectiveness because she doesn't have that much effect resist. But let's go ahead and wipe her out. And blam, Hell Queen is down. And that is the final Hell Raid boss. So hopefully um, I did a good job explaining how to defeat all of these bosses. Best of luck clearing them. And uh, let's move on to the conclusion. All right, so that's the end of my Hell Raid guide. If you do it successfully enough times, you'll be able to get to this sweet, sweet moment when you can buy one of this awesome 88 gear. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below. And best of luck, guys. Till next time, see you later.